I'm going to be talking about scalability and sustainability of behavior change programs. And um, I, I want to start with a quote by the uh, recent ex-director of the National Cancer Institute, where he starts talking about how we'll be able to specifically tailor our prevention and treatment for each individual patient. Um, now, of course, he's not talking about health communications or behavior change. He's really talking about personalized, tailored therapy, which is great, but that's, um, but that's relevant to what we've been doing for a very long time. In fact, uh, since about 1990, we've been very interested in the role of interactive technologies well before the internet, being able to tailor the educational message for every individual patient. Now, what do I mean by tailoring? If, if I just, let's say we all have a charge. We all have to build a video, an audio program, a website, a mobile program, whatever it is for a broad spectrum of the population. Uh, for diabetes, for example, or for smoking cessation, or for weight management, or whatever you want. You st would start saying, okay, well, we have to have messages for different demographic groups, right? Because there's tremendous diversity. We have to have different motivational messages depending on the kinds of motives you have, if you have any. Types of benefits you might have, um, your barriers, your environment, whatever. And normally, we'd have to put all those into one big, gigantic message, a one-size-fits-all message. And we've known in mass media for about 30 years that those have very, very little impact. So the idea of tailoring is if you could collect some information from the individual, at that individual level, um, and find out that they have a red demographic, they're a blue level of motivation, they don't perceive any benefits of changing, they have a lot of barriers. You could assemble that and put that into a message for that person, and I'm using that kind of generally, but this tailored message uh, would be something special for that individual. So you can imagine the number of questions then. If this is a, a suit that's tailored to you, what are the different measures you'd need to create for a suit? And then when do you create a style of a suit? You know, you could build the basics of a suit, but how about the style? and that relates to different theoretical approaches and styles we take for approaching the concept of behavior change. So that's what we do at our Center for Health Communication Research at the University of Michigan. We collect expert, experts from around the world, put them together, and they build messages. We collect data from the user, and then we have a tailoring algorithm or engine that builds a specific story to you, your to your specific needs. And we've been doing this now since 19. 90, as I said before, testing a lot of these kind of programs in a broad variety of areas. So what do we know now? That's one of the big questions that um, I thought about for this talk. One of the things we know for a, long, for a fairly long time now is that tailoring seems to work. Here's one of our very first studies we conducted in 1993 on dietary fat, where we collected in family practice waiting rooms. We had about something like 15, 20 different family practice waiting rooms around rural North Carolina. So we had all these patients sitting in waiting rooms. Now the average wait time in a waiting room, what? 20 minutes? 30 minutes, it's long, you know? And there's 1957 Highlights magazines, and you know, there's Norman Rockwell pictures. So when we'd have a research assistant come up to these people and say, would you mind being part of a study and fill out this questionnaire, they'd go, thank you. We'd have like a 95% response rate, it was amazing. And we'd collect these data and then bring them back to our offices and then use a software algorithm that could tailor a guide for a person's dietary fat intake related to their favorite foods, you know, what they like to eat, whether they had dietary needs, uh, whether they're the shopper, whether they're the cook, whether they had any special health issues, a lot of different things. And we collected data from 450 family practice patients in these different waiting rooms. And then about a week later, after going through these algorithms, we sent out to 150 patients a tailored message that looked similar to the one you just saw that's deeply tailored. So we could create roughly 500,000 different variations of that tailored message helping you reduce your dietary fat intake. That makes sense to everybody? Okay, 150 people got untailored messages mailed to them on the same stationery. It had the same look to it. It all had dietary fat reduction messages in it, but it was not tailored to them other than their name was tailored at the top. So we wanted to make sure that they had that personalization. Or we mailed no message whatsoever to them. Four months later, we surveyed these 450 patients to see how they did. And the first question we asked is, do you remember getting things in the mail about dietary fat uh, reduction? And in the no message group, 15% who never got any message distinctly remembered getting a message. So these people are liars. Maybe they're not liars, but you know, they're, 
you know, their noise. So we can subtract them from the other two groups. And we find still this whopping statistically significant difference between the tailored and untailored just in terms of memory. I'll get back to that because memory is really important as we're building these kinds of intervention campaigns that you remember the message. The other thing though, more importantly, is that we found a 23% reduction in dietary fat uh, in the tailored group, 23%, that's a lot, 10 grams a day on average in the tailored group versus four grams versus one gram in the no message group. And that's all, again, statistically significant. That made us go, hmm, this is kind of interesting. We should do more work. More recently, we looked at walking behavior. Now, if I handed a pedometer to each of you out here, and, and let's say you're all senior diabetics, elderly diet, type two diabetics, and you all need to walk. And so we handed pedometers to all of you and said, do your best with this pedometer now. But we'd like every week for you to plug it into the computer and then monitor and then we'll up and upload the data to this site and we'll be able to monitor you over a long period of time, over six months. After six months of doing that, if we just said do your best, how many extra steps over baseline would we be increasing these senior, these elderly type two diabetics behavior? How many extra steps after six months? Handing everybody a pedometer saying do your best. Zero, none. There are three studies of this that have shown no extra steps from just handing out a pedometer. What if I add these guys? Coaches. The coaches say, you know what, let's set a goal with you now. Let's set a, a new goal to see, you know, uh, how you're doing on the basis. On the basis of what you've done so far, let's set a new goal. Now let's set a stretch goal. Let's keep working on this. After six months, if you add a coach, you can add about one mile over baseline on average per day. One mile of walking. That's a lot. So a coach is good. But a lot of disease management companies have coaches, and a lot of them charge two to four thousand dollars a year for those coaches. So that's a lot. If you just go to Curves or something, you'll pay a lot less. You might get a coach, and that's very cool. And we need models like that that are sustainable. Uh, but that's so a coach is good, but they can be expensive. Uh, so we ran a study with a group of people from our family practice, family medicine department, where we created a computer program that simply set goals for you. So we didn't have the coach. This program basically was the coach, this interactive software program that set goals. After six months, and now we have two studies of this, we followed elderly type two diabetics. After six months, how many added steps do we achieve with this kind of program? One mile. So we get the same added benefit as we have with a coach. And this program doesn't cost as much because we're moving electrons around. That's cheaper. Electrons are cheaper than humans, even though they're part electrons. So um, anyway, we built another program for asthmatic kids. These are inner city kids uh, who have asthma who are about 12 to 14 years old in inner city Detroit. I'm just going to show you a real quick, almost an advertisement of this program, just to see some of the, the way we thought about this, the way we designed it. So you can see this is not text-based at all, it's but it is tailored. City DJ. Man. Are you trying to do this all on your own? This is what makes up dust. Bam. Ah. Many of professional athletes have asthma. They've learned to keep their asthma under control. I bet you wish you had that money you spend on cigarettes. For real. Are you packing your rescue inhaler? I don't have anywhere to put it. Is it that big? As long as you're packing that inhaler, you can roll with the big dog. Okay, so Pump this program was out. designed with kids from inner city Detroit who actually helped build it, made all the decisions. And this is tailored. So we collect information initially, and then uh, this program interacts with you, but, but in an animated fashion. What we found in this program in a randomized trial where kids in the control group were on an asthma control program, but it was not tailored. It was a web-based asthma control program. But it, this one found higher ER, uh, a higher reduction in ER visits a reduction in hospital visits, reduction in school days missed, and symptoms, symptom days missed, uh, and many other things. This is all published. Happy to send you any of the publications in this, uh, in this presentation. And what's important here is that this program overall cost $6.66, and that included the building of the program. So that's not bad. If you're paying an asthma coordinator or a nurse at the school, you're paying a lot more than that, than $6.66, to achieve these kinds of results that were found, which are very significant. Um, now, one big question is how much tailoring do you actually need? 
Uh, this is a big question because all of our programmers and our health educators are going, I hope we don't have to tailor too deeply because it's hard. It's hard work to do this, you know? I mean, you really have to be thinking carefully, and, and it takes months longer to tailor something very deeply. And um, in other words, when we tailor down to a more granular level, what happens? Does it actually produce an effect? And everybody thought, oh, there's some asymptote to that. And here's an example of a less tailored message. And we have Jennifer McClure here in, in the audience. I didn't know you were here, Jennifer. That's so cool. She was one of the co-authors of this study uh, at, from Group Health Cooperative. But we tailored, and this is an example of a lightly tailored message that we sent out through the internet. And here's an example of a more deeply tailored message that we would send out through the internet. And these are just examples of components of a bigger smoking cessation program that we put together for people. But this is an example where we could create millions of variations of this um, story of a person because we use more data. So we took a look at um, a number of different components of this, and what we did was add up all the highly tailored components, and we dropped it, we graded it down to the less tailored components. So some people got very lightly tailored programming, other people, and it went all the way up in a graded fashion to very deeply tailored programming. We gave everybody nicotine patch therapy, and six months later, what we found, in the most tailored group, a 39% quit rate. Now that's pretty high. If you run any sort of group therapy program, if you run any program that involves nicotine replacement therapy, that is still a very, very high quit rate. And this program costs about 50 cents a person. So it just doesn't cost much once you've built the program. You can replicate this. Also, you can scale it to millions and millions of people. One of my jobs today is to talk about scalability. You can scale with quality. And that's one of the things that's always been a difficult thing for people in public health to really do effectively. So 39% is good. Um, this is all published again in the American Journal of uh, Preventive Medicine. Jennifer is one of the authors on it. Um, and then we also wanted to take a look is it important, by the way, to have this image? If you're an African-American young woman, is it important to have a young African-American woman in the page? rather than you know, a lot of other alternatives that we often put into our health education materials. We just wanted to find out. So we randomized people to getting matched images, matched to their demographics, their age, race, and gender, or mismatched to their age, race, and gender, or we had the classic health educator sunset scene. The sunset scene was a control condition, so you know. Mountains, you know, all that crap. Anyway, I just had to test that out. So um, we tested these three, but we kept the message the same. These were for smokers who wanted to quit. And, and the first thing we did is just read their eyes. We just wanted to see how they read the message. Now here's how people often read these messages. So they're reading the first sentence, then they're reading the first sentence again, then they read the first sentence again, then they go to the second sentence, they look, nice shirt, goes to his shirt, skips the rest of that paragraph, goes to the first sentence of the second paragraph, very nice, that nice, okay. Nice shirt, goes back, I don't know why. But anyway, you can monitor all this. We can map out where people's eyes go. And um, this certainly is not how we wrote this message. You know, people don't read it the way we wrote it. That kind of pissed me off. So, um, but we can look at how many saccades or rapid eye movements that go between the picture, the image, and the text. And there's some data that suggests that when you go back and forth to a picture, you're elaborating on the message more. So you're saying, is this like me? What is it about that picture? Oh, wow, is that person going through this? And so they're starting to connect the image with the, uh, with the text, and it can actually enhance the text. Now, notice there were twice as many saccades going to the image from this text when it was matched than when it was mismatched, and twice again as many, on average, when in the sunset scene, although they did seem to be attracted to the guy's crotch. I don't know why. <laughs> uh, but half as many again. And then what we found, we asked people, where are you convinced by the message afterwards? And people were about t roughly twice as convinced by the picture, by the match picture. They're twice as convinced by the text when you had a matched image as the same text when you had the mismatched image. Isn't that weird? Anyway, it's weird to me. In other words, it's saying we should tailor to these kinds of images as well. So let's cross the chasm. This is just a little bit, just a smattering of, of the kind of research that we've developed over the last 25 years. But let's cross the chasm. There was a time when you couldn't walk down the street with a thousand songs in your pocket. Now you can, thanks to digital music. There was a time when you couldn't move a thousand bucks from savings to checking before the bank opened on Monday. Now you can, 
thanks to digital banking. And if you wanted professional, confidential health guidance on a wide variety of topics, customized to meet your needs in one place, 24-7? Well, guess what? Now you can. Thanks to Digital Health Coaching. So this is a company that we developed in 1998 with a guy named Rick Snyder who was um, from Gateway Computers. He was CEO of Gateway Computers. And, um, and so we set this up together as a technology transfer development out of the University of Michigan to use and apply the science that we were learning in our laboratory and around the world, frankly, uh, into the real world. And by the way, Rick Snyder is now the governor of the state of Michigan. So he, he's done fairly well for himself. Um, and actually, he's very interested in wellness, which is nice. Um, so anyway, Health Media develops these digitally tailored programs now in a fairly comprehensive way. And I'd like to talk about how those are developed and how we think about scalability and sustainability at Health Media as well as um, anywhere else. And I want to use this moniker called IDEAL. IDEAL meaning integrated, data-centric, evidence-based, adaptive, and longitudinal. So I'm going to go through these real quickly. By integrated, I mean that an integrated program, and by the way, I'm relating all this back to sustainability of programs. How do you build something that's effective, that's sustainable, that's scalable? And the first way to do that, in my mind, and I'm just giving you my opinion about this, uh, is to have an integrated program that has multiple components. There's no one side, there's no perfect single solution for a large population. So we don't have the single solution for a large population. Nobody else does either. Uh, it's important to be able to integrate multiple components, though, that share an understanding of that client, of the end user. So for example, we should be able to connect with an EMR. We already are now with Kaiser Permanente with their epic electronic medical record. So the physician now knows when a person, when one of their members has taken a health risk assessment, one of our health media health risk assessments, it goes into the electronic medical record. We also know, the physician knows, what they're interested in changing and what kind of programs they've already started working on within health media. So they know whether they might need to or want to prescribe uh, one of these programs in the future. So, and other people are doing this. I know Group Health is working on this sort of thing as well, I believe. Uh, but there are many groups that are trying to combine what I'd call consumer health informatics with medical informatics. I think this is a huge future. We're combining, obviously, with biometrics. So, linking with other biometric devices. You should be able to do that so you don't have to rely solely on the person's memory of what their cholesterol is. We need to be combining this with coaches. We do at Health Media. Other groups are starting to do this as well. And the big question is, what, you know, are you more e-health centric or are you coach centric? And, you know, those are be interesting questions down the road and it'll be, you know, there will be different mixes for different kinds of populations. But we should be able to provide this e-health uh, programming to health navigators or health coaches. And we're exploring this as well in developing countries right now where you could build microfinanced programs uh, teaching people, even hairdressers for example, how to become health navigators. In fact, give me a hundred hairdressers, you can have a hundred doctors, we'll take a thousand patients who are diabetics and I'll maintain their A1Cs as well as you will for half the price and I'll bet you a hundred thousand dollars that I can do it. Anybody. I know I can because we've already done it. So we've done this with hairdressers. They're better listeners. They're trained to listen. If they're not good listeners, they're no longer hairdressers. Clinicians are trained to give advice. And no offense, it's just that's what they're trained to do. They're not trained to listen. So MI comes really hard. Motivational interviewing is tough for a lot of clinicians because they're so used to telling you what to do. So, you know, that's, that's an issue. We should be combining with programs as well. Obviously, we have a lot of different programs that talk to each other now that link back to a health risk assessment, and so that's important. And link with partners. As I said, there's no particular solution that is the New Jerusalem for everybody. So we know that linking with other companies, other partners doing cool things is, is a great way to go, and we've won from that, and so have our partners. Um, the D is data centrism. The data management programming should be integrated in a way with the behavioral intervention so that you can analyze intervention pathways, modal pathways. I'll give you some examples of that. So when, when we collect information on a health risk assessment, we followed some people now for five to 10 years. And we can monitor 
Uh, so people have taken our health risk assessment, for example, in 2005. We can look at them now. We can look at their health in 2005 and see, look at what their health is now, but we can also look at these other behaviors. And from that, we can start uh, predicting which behaviors are most influential of health down the road. Uh, five years from now. So we can actually study health status and look at the various contributions of sleep, stress, nutrition, physical activity, weight, et cetera, and then we can apply programs for our customers to, uh, to be able to use with their, with their members or with their employees. We can do this with quality of life because our health risk assessment asks all about quality of life. We can do it with healthcare costs because we lock in with a lot of our health plan partners and we know how much everybody costs at an individual level and we can link that with their health risk assessment. We can also do this with workplace productivity because we ask workplace productivity questions that have been validated by other people, and we put those in. So we can look at these various predictors. That's important. We can link um, the number of risk factors you have to cost. We can link the number of risk factors you have to loss of productivity. All of these things are helpful for an employer or for an insurer for a health plan. We can get into detail. This is just a spread of depression symptoms and a, a number of uh, depression symptom days and then how much each of these cost. So by the way, later in the day, Steve Schwartz is gonna be, uh, who is from Health Media, he's a PhD psychologist. He's gonna be talking more about some of these data that we have. So I'm not gonna get into great detail of that. The E stands for evidence or evidence base. The content of the behavioral intervention needs to be built on a basis of theory-informed research. I don't think theory-driven. I don't think we take our theories, they're not good enough for one thing, and let them completely drive what we're doing. But letting them inform what we do in a careful way is terribly important, and that's why we've seen advances in behavior change over the last 50 years, moving from information models to attitude and belief models. Now we're doing so much more interesting, we have so many more interesting models related to motivation and values, as I'll talk about in just a bit. But you know, the point is when people say we tailor, very often it's tailored on those outer rings of the onion, you know, on their health status or their demographics. But we can tailor, and it, I think it's very important to tailor to things right at the core related to some of these things very directly related to behavior change. So this is just an example. One paragraph that we have is, is using a lot of different theories, a lot of different approaches to the programming. Here's an example where we just are looking analytically at people's self-efficacy, their confidence that they can quit smoking, and their motivation to quit smoking, and we tend to find that everybody is over here on that lower right side. They have high motivation, but very low self-confidence. That's where most people are. And that's important for us to know, and we can start targeting those people with marketing campaigns more, you know, more specifically. Here's an example with HIV. These are people who just started highly active antiretroviral therapy over the first couple of months, and what happens is that they bifurcate. Some people are very, have very low motivation. In fact, you see these two mountains. That's what's happening. People end up with very low motivation and confidence, or people end up with very high motivation and confidence after just a few months of taking heart therapy highly active antiretroviral therapy. But the adherence level on the low group, 3.7 out of 5, roughly 70% or so, those people will die if they maintain that level. So we can target those people, whereas the people up in the upper right will live. Those are big issues for us to deal with. Um, there's a study that was done by Kaiser Permanente looking at this kind of tailoring. So they wanted to, to take a look at our uh, balance program, a weight management program, and compare it with their existing online program. And what they found, this is all published, and I'm not gonna, I don't have time to get into detail, but what they found was on average, over one year, a reduction of 1.1 office visits in the group that was more tailored in this balance program. So that equated with roughly $110 per year per person just in the weight management program, $110. The program costs them $5 per person. So you see the return on investment. Often we talk about three, four to one ROI. Well, these can get much higher because you're reducing the cost so much. So when you drop the denominator down, you know, like you can with eHealth, you can start scaling effectively and see an ROI that we haven't talked about before, frankly. Um, on the basis of that study and a number of other studies KP did, they developed what's called the Thrive Campaign. Some of you may be aware of this campaign. Who is aware of Thrive? Okay, so a number of you are. So anyway, Thrive, this is an, uh, a commercial for Thrive. Gather around people wherever you roam And admit that the 
waters around you have grown And accept it that soon you'll be drenched to the bone If your time to you is worth saving Then you better start swimming or you'll sink like a stone For the times they are changing So the idea is to get people to go to the online programming. And now over, as of this summer, over a million people have gone to the online programming at KP to use this, uh, these e-health programs. That's a lot. Um, so getting back to the adaptive part, uh, the A part stands for uh, adaptive or tailored adaptive communication, removing all the extraneous feedback while focusing on the things that are most important. And we've kind of already talked about that. We've talked about, in fact, the importance of deep tailoring. So while people say we tailor, it's not the same usually. So you have to think about what do we mean by tailoring? What is that exactly? Um, and then, fi and we've talked about it enough, so I don't have to get into detail. And then finally, longitudinal. By that, what I mean, and, and you know, this is actually in, in the guide. Michael uh, has written about this, uh, talking about EMA, or ecological momentary assessment, the ability to momentarily, uh, to collect information momentarily from you wherever you are in your environment, ecological momentary assessment. But now, more important, or as important, is EMI, ecological momentary intervention. Being able to say, when should we provide just the right help at the right time? Which is probably a lot better than the, a lot of help at the wrong time. So we have to think about where is the right help at the right time? What can we do? And this is an emerging area. I'm not saying this is solved. But this is what we mean by quantified self. When we're collecting data ecologically in, in, in your environment, momentarily, all the time. And then we can provide feedback, hopefully. So we're not just collecting biometric data. That's cool. But we've known for about 50 years that information alone does not change behavior. So we need to provide just the right tweaking at the right time to help you. So that's going to be really important. Also, we can take these products that are developed around smoking or weight management, and after an initial health risk assessment, have the products talk to one another. We know, for example, that um, when we gather smokers and identify smokers through a health risk assessment, and then we offer them a smoking cessation program, that you know a fair number of them uh, try the smoking cessation program if it's online. In this case, this is with uh, United Parcel Service, 18% of all their smokers in their main headquarters adopted who smoked uh, took on Breathe, and then 29% quit. That's not too bad overall especially considering if you just sent out newsletters or put posters up to the smokers, roughly six people would show up. It's almost a physical law. And then three people would quit, and then they'd go, great, we got a 50% quit rate. You go, no, no, you, you have a lot of smokers there, and you have to get more people quitting. So anyway, that's, that's what I think about um, uh, sustainability. And I want to talk just a little bit to close about where we're heading. I am very interested in the role of behaviors and core values now. Over the last year, I've been thinking about this a lot. In some of our products, and other products too, I'm not just talking about ours, but in a lot of products now, they're starting to collect values. So which value or trait, be, being successful or in control or responsible or disciplined or energetic, a good father, or whatever, is important to me. You get to pick. And then on the basis of that, obviously, we can tailor a message saying, here's how changing your behavior will lead to some of those goals. And that's well and good. I think this is a, a cool start. Now we're starting to put into a portal uh, the ability to write in your mission. And I think that's fine. But what we're really trying to do, let's just take, for example, a health risk assessment. An HRA, really ideally, or any health message, is designed to do this. Get the person to go, wow, I never heard that before. This is brand new. I can't wait to change. Aha, wow. Does that happen? No, HRAs are boring questionnaires that tell you what you already know. We have to pay people to take the stupid things. And we have all these speakers all the time talking about incentives. Why should, you know, what if I said, what if you said, oh, I'll pay you, Vic, $500. By the way, Johnson & Johnson pays people, their employees $500 to take a health risk assessment. Vic, I'll pay you $500 to drink the rest of this water. What would you think? This water has to suck. I mean, what's wrong with this water? I mean, what are you trying to do to me? What are you collecting from me? My, my saliva? My DNA? What is wrong? You know, and then the next time they say, oh, but would you drink this? Well, if you pay me $500, yeah. 
I mean, you've gotten into this loop where suddenly the value isn't because I'm going to improve my health, because I'm going to be able to reach my purpose in life. I'm paying you. So suddenly all of the motive, the incentive is extrinsic. And I don't think that's a good idea, quite honestly. I think maybe in some cases you can get a horse to water, you know, through incentives, but we have to be really much, much more careful and sophisticated with incentives, frankly. But anyway, how do we get this aha to create change? That's a big deal. This is what I've been thinking about all year. So um, what, what, is, what do health messages do? They create dissonance. Vic, you drink too much. Well, okay, we want you to drink less. That, there's a difference between who I am and what you or me, what I want to be, right? So there's dissonance created. What happens when you tell me that, though? What happens when you say, Vic, you drink too much, or you smoke, or you don't work out enough, or blah, blah, blah? We usually become defensive, right? We put this big wall up of defensiveness, and we slam the message, you don't know what you're talking about, or the messenger, right? This message is stupid, or you are stupid. There's something about it. We slam the message or the messenger, and it's because our ego is being threatened. This wall kind of surrounds our inner ego, our self, and we're being threatened by that, so we don't change. Duh. And we wonder why people don't change. We, none of us change. If, if we didn't have this wall, you know, and somebody says, hey, you should watch Fox News tonight and become a Republican. Okay, fine, you know, no problem, or vice versa, whatever. We just change all the time and our heads would explode. So we have to be careful. So we want to create this aha moment, right? So how do we do that? How do we generate motivation? And, you know, there's other parts of this that I don't have time to talk about, but I want to think about defensiveness as this great big wall. In motivational interviewing, they talk about focusing on ideals to help reduce defensiveness. That's cool. And in fact, there's a bunch of new studies, and I would just PubMed self-affirmation theory, because what they do is have people write down their core values, and when they write down their core values, they're much more likely, compared to people who've just written down something else, like their daily routine or the events of the week or whatever, they're much more likely to become less defensive and accept health messages, much, much more likely. So this woman, Jenny Crocker, wrote a great article this summer, or I, I, that I found this summer, Why Does Writing About Important Values Reduce Defensiveness? She says it's because you are self-transcending. This is really weird. Okay, so now we're going to talk about self-transcendence. Here's a good study of this. Okay, so Jenny Crocker and her doctoral student took college students, and I'm not going to get into detail about this. Basically, though, they threatened their ego or they didn't threaten their ego. And, and through a self -select. think about when you were in a playground and you were picked for the kickball team or not, okay? If you were picked, you know, then your ego wasn't threatened. If you weren't picked, your ego was very threatened, right? Okay, so threatened people didn't threaten people. A guy named Roy Baumeister has done a lot of this kind of research. So then they had people in both groups write down self-transcendent values, empathy, support needs, uh, things like that, things larger than yourself. Or they wrote down self-enhancing values, power. These are like Britney Spears values, you know, Charlie Sheen values. Um, you know, well, I'm sorry, I'll get sued for that. Independence, take that off the tape, please. I'm just kidding. Um, attractiveness, prestige, et cetera. Or they wrote down their daily routines in both groups. And then they said, you know what? We have another study. If you wouldn't mind, we've got all these warm chocolate chip cookies, and we would love you to taste test these cookies. For some reason, they had a 100% response rate. Everybody said, sure, I'll do that. And so they asked them to taste the texture and aroma and color, and, you know, everything else about these cookies. Of course, that was a sham. They wanted to find out how many cookies they ate because Roy Baumeister has found that when you compare people who have had their ego threatened compared with people who have not had their ego threatened, you, you will find a greater number of cookies eaten, okay? So I threaten your ego, you freak out, you eat more cookies. Okay, but they did something very clever too. In self-affirmation theory, it says that if you write down your core values, and this, forget about the right side now, if you write down your core values, whether they're transcending or enhancing, you are less likely to eat the cookies than if you have just filled out, if you haven't written down your values. Does that make sense so far? Really cool, though, is, and this is still significant, people writing down their transcendent values ate less cookies than people writing down self-enhancing Charlie Sheen values. This is awesome. So, to me, I think what we should be doing now is thinking about ways of helping people transcend themselves. Think about something bigger than themselves. And the way we want to do it is through a mission or values. 
Here's an example. How much time do I have before questions? Total? No way. Really? Okay. All right. I'll be quick. Okay. So let's say this person says, we ask them, what's your mission in life? And uh, we could have them actually write down their core values in their life. Let's, uh, before they even fill out um, an HRA. So they're thinking about their core values and then we ask them how many cigarettes they smoke. And we ask them other questions related to health. We think that if we ask these kinds of questions before an HRA, it'll do two things. It'll make people more valid about what, how they respond. And second, they'll be more likely to take on a behavior change program. So that's what we think. And just to close real quickly, I think that we have been moving in this field in this direction where we're always worried about death. Health risk assessments aren't health risk assessments. They're really death risk assessments. We're always worried about, you know, oh, they'll give you a risk age. It's really focused on disease and death. What I think we need to be doing is turning this paradigm around where we think about energy to achieve a purpose in life, a mission in life, things that relate to your core values. Then, with this change in paradigm, you're starting to think about these diseases as the potential inhibitors to achieving your mission. Mark Twain said, I don't care about dying, I'm very worried about not living. And the only reason I think most people who are sick or near death are scared is that they're scared really that they're not going to be able to achieve the things that they wanted to achieve. At least I think that's a healthy way of thinking about this. And this is what we should start promoting. And I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Thanks, a great talk. Uh, so could you tell a little bit about how those um, tailored messages are generated, how automated that is? How much yeah, uh, everything, everything that we have built uh, comes from a tailoring engine. Uh, both in our laboratory at the University of Michigan and at Health Media, we spent literally millions of dollars on each of those engines to develop uh, an easy way for health experts to write messages and to create essentially very deeply tailored flow diagrams uh, that then where you collect data then and then it creates these messages automatically and and at health media these can generate messages on mobile phones or on paper you know using digitally tailored print materials or on the web of course and and many other means so it's a tailoring engine that's required yeah this is kind of personal to say in a public scenario so I'm Tracy Gaudet, and we are soulmates. So, <laughs> I mean, nice. on the professional level, of course. We'll, we'll, so we will we'll, we'll meet a little later. Are you going to be here for the whole program? Yeah. Okay, because I'm talking later in the day, and I, I just because everything you have said, I'm sitting here whacking my colleague, going, he's so right, because that's what I think. So we're, we'll chat more, but we've Thank actually you. done some clinical modeling not with the IT side of this, but just kind of the actual model. If you have an HRA and you coach it in just this way, do you get different outcomes? Of course you do. Um, so I look forward to chatting more with you. And thank Great. you. I learned a lot from your talk. So thank, thank you, you very, very much. Thank you very much for saying that. I really appreciate that. Thank you. Yes. So the question is, how does this intersect with the hairdressers? And I know it's not a joke. Actually, it's exactly what we're looking at. You know, lay health advisor models have been around for 25 years, where you pick out people who are kind of nodal points in communities, and you say, OK, get people to engage in mammography or whatever. And they have very tiny effects. And one of the biggest reasons, I think, is because they don't have the right tools. So if we could provide a, a woman in rural India who is a hairdresser or a pharmacist or a midwife or whoever with these tools, with a kiosk that includes internet access and includes these tools that could be printed out and maybe not with so many words or whatever, but we could print very elegant, simple pieces for them. We think that they would have the right tools to then become a very effective coach at an extraordinarily low cost. Now, why just do this in India? We should be able to do this in the US as well and, in fact, increase increase employment rates that way. I really see a network, a cadre, of maybe hundreds of thousands of these health navigators around the country using these kinds of tools. And we can talk later about it. I know I'm kind of out of time. Thank you. Thanks. Sure.